This conference will now be recorded. To the organizers, do we have a um, introduction prepared? Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. We are starting. Okay. Yes, ma'am. A very good evening to one and all present here. I am Sneha Mahajan, executive organizer. On behalf of BioSetup Life Sciences, take this honor to welcome our founder coordinator, Argyadeep Das, sir, event coordinators, Dr. Sudeep Das, Dr. Kavita Pal. Dr. Arpana Sharma, Dr. Ritu Chandel, Mrs. Somaji Bhargavi, and today's eminent guest speaker, Dr. Laura Harris. Faculty members, organizers, and all my dear student participants, I welcome you all for the international webinar on an educational bioinformatics project to improve genome annotation, organized by BioSetup Life Sciences in collaboration with Michigan State University and ICER. I hope you all are good and safe at your end. Before starting the session, a humble request to all the participants, please do not share your audio, video, or screen sharing in order to avoid any kind of disturbance. If you have any doubt during the session, please use the chat box. Filling of the feedback form is mandatory. Now let me tell you about BioSetup Life Sciences. BioSetup Life Sciences is a hub of scientific research and learning approved by ISO 9001-2015 certified organization and also MSME registered under Government of India. We have multidisciplinary team of eminent and experienced faculty members and research associates that provide support to aspiring students in life sciences. We have successfully organized many webinars, workshops, internship programs, e-training programs, certification courses, career counseling, and competitive exam preparation for CSIR, IIT JAM, Gate B, IISC, and DBT. We are continuously working for the career improvement of students. As we all are aware, we have been facing difficult times during the ongoing pandemic since two years, but we believe in not stopping and giving quality education to the budding minds through online platform. You must have also heard that empty rakes makes more noise. So it's important to keep filling the bucket of knowledge through any source available. Keeping this in mind, now I would like to introduce our event coordinators, Dr. Sudeep Das, Dr. Kavita Pal, Dr. Arpana Sharma, Dr. Ritu Chandel, and Mrs. Somaji Bhargavi Ma. About Dr. Sudeep Das. Dr. Das is lung infection biologist and human microbiome expert. Dr. Das is postdoctoral fellow, University of Lausanne, Switzerland. He has received several accolades and has high impact publication in renowned international journals. He was a Swiss Academy of Science Scholar, DAD Fellow, DFG Career Development Fellow, and currently a holder of highly prestigious Marie Curie Fellow from the European Union. Next, we have Dr. Kavita Paul. Dr. Kavita Paul is a scientist at Advanced Center for Treatment Research for Cancer, Tata Memorial Center, Mumbai, India. She has vast experience in the field of nanodrug delivery, cancer biology, and clinical studies. She has done her graduation and post-graduation in microbiology from Nagpur University, PhD from Pune University, India, and also done her MBA in project management. She has 10 years of teaching experience and research experience. Her areas of expertise are nanomedicine, drug delivery system, preclinical and clinical studies. She has two patents, 15 publications. Next, we have Dr. Arpana Sharma. She has a research expertise in cancer biology, molecular biology, and cell biology. She has done her MSc in biology, biotechnology, MPhil PhD in life sciences. Ma'am has qualified her CSIR net with JRF, All India ranking 13. She has cleared CSIR thrice for lectureship, SRF, GATE, GSET examination. Ma'am is also selected for visiting research associate in Colorado University, USA. 
presently ma'am is working ma'am is visiting research fellow at chitrangan national cancer institute ministry of health and family welfare government of india next we have dr ritu s chandel she is mbbs md in biochemistry as as well as a very renowned speaker and tutor ma'am is currently working with bridge candy hospital trust mumbai maharashtra she has published multiple articles in various national and international journal and academic books next we have mrs somuji bhargavi ma'am she has done her msc phd she is she has complete cleared her examinations such as gate tset currently ma'am is working as a lecturer in biotechnology and microbiology now i request dr sudeep das to introduce our today's eminent guest speaker dr laura harris ma'am over to you sir thank you uh hello everyone uh, very good evening to all of you and uh, good morning on the other side of the pond to uh, dr harris um yeah it's my pleasure in welcoming dr laura harris from michigan state university um she's a scientist and an educator who uh, employs developing curriculum involved in data sciences and computational biology uh, she has been working in a lot of projects which combine both wet lab and bioinformatics um and she's been working on projects involving gene expression changes in antibiotic resistance uh, cancer and more recently uh, in stars cov2 research uh, and uh, it's really a, uh, a very nice of you to to take out time and uh, teach all the the budding minds who have joined here today and i hope uh, let's keep it short and i hope i everyone uh, just enjoys and learns along the way with you so over to you ma'am Awesome. Thank you so much for the introduction. I appreciate it. And I'm very happy to be here with you all today. So, my talk today is a little different. Um I'm talking more from an educator standpoint than from a research standpoint. Uh, but one of the things that I feel very strongly about is incorporating research into the classroom. and that's very easy to do with bioinformatics but it's also intimidating to some students particularly those that have more of a background in biology rather than computational science so this was a project that i developed for my classroom to teach undergraduate biology students something about bioinformatics and also improve our research ability at the same time by improving genome annotation. So my title today, the Educational Bioinformatics Project to Improve Genome Annotation. And again, my name is Laura Harris. I'm the Director of Training at the Institute for Cyber Enabled Research or ICER for short um, at Michigan State University. If you have any questions, you can reach me at training@msu.edu. So let's get started. So the overall goal of this educational project is to teach biology students interdisciplinary concepts in bioinformatics, biochemistry, and genetics. And we're going to do this using an inquiry-based computational approach or research approach. This project is innovative because it's the first time that an educational project has been developed that actively improves gene annotation in the public genome knowledge base knowledge bases, excuse me, that we all use every day. Things like NCBI, Uniprot, those things that we go to when we want sequences or we want gene ontology connections and that sort of thing. So a little bit about the background of gene annotation. We got to start with a definition. So an open reading frame, which I'll abbreviate in this talk as ORF, is a continual stretch of DNA that begins with a start codon, ends in a stop codon, and has the proper number of nucleotides in between that start and stop to potentially encode a protein. That's functional. You can also think of this as the amino acid sequence or the primary protein sequence. And the idea here is that one open reading frame will effectively encode one functional protein. 
Now, the number of open reading frames in a given genome varies widely. In some viruses, you're looking at maybe 20 open reading frames. Bacteria can be around two to 5,000. Human genome, you're looking at around 30,000 open reading frames. But regardless of how many we have, what is important is how they are annotated. So in other words, can we determine what those sequences actually do inside of a cell? And so we start with a computational prediction. So on the right side of the screen here, hopefully you can see my cursor moving, you'll see in the black box gene predictions. So the black line is effectively a piece of DNA and the black boxes represent individual open reading frames. Each individual open reading frame or black box would then have its sequence go through various domain motif programs such as PFAM or the CDD, the Conserved Domain Database. It can go through orthology searches such as KEG or eggnog, and it can go through homology searches such as BLAST. Once the computer will collect all this information on a particular open reading frame, the computer will then attempt to assign a gene symbol, a gene ID, a gene description, so that when people look at the knowledge base, they then can say, oh, this open reading frame on the left side is most likely a polymerase. So that's the idea here. The trick though, or the challenge I should say, is that hypothetical proteins exist. And so a hypothetical protein is an open reading frame where we do not know what the function is. The computer could not accurately identify any connection to established proteins. And so again, the genomes can range. The human genome has around 5% HPs or hypothetical proteins. But of course, we're selfish biased humans. We're gonna try to annotate our genome first. If you look at some of the bacterial strains, you can see up to 70% of a genome is labeled as hypothetical protein. And so that means the majority of that strain's genome, we do not know what those proteins do. And that then inhibits our ability to develop therapeutic agents to use in the clinic, to know how infection progresses in a cell, et cetera. In average, around 15 to 30% or around one fourth of a given genome is likely to be made up of hypothetical proteins. And so that can be an issue, and I'll talk about that in just a second. But let's talk about the two types of hypothetical proteins that can exist first. A hypothetical protein can be a cause, or how to put it, uh, is caused by an outdated annotation. So let's say that I have a genome that got deposited back in 2000, and no one has gone through the knowledge base and updated the annotation. So therefore, if we just rerun the computer program that I showed you on the prior slide, we could improve annotation of this outdated genome. But if it's a newly deposited genome, their hypothetical proteins are involved in what we call indeterminate annotation. So we simply don't have enough information to be able to determine what it does. And those we call true hypothetical proteins, and they're really good candidates for the lab, for experimental examinations. Things like knockout models, X-ray crystallography, NMR for structural determination. And once we have that data, then we can update outdated annotation using the new data that came in from the experiment. Okay. There will be time at the end for questions. So I said I'd get into the significance of hypothetical proteins and the fact that 25-ish percent of any given genome probably is HP. If you look at November of 2020, when I published my paper on this project, there were almost 220 million gene sequences in GenBank. So if we assume that 20% of those sequences are hypothetical proteins, that means there's about 43 million proteins 
that need proper annotation. That's a lot of work. And so if we turn students into people that can help correct this problem, they learn and we get better database, better research. So let's assume that we proceed with this plan and that students are able to annotate just 10% of that 43 million. That's 4 million proteins in our database that have improved annotation. So is this a realistic goal? Yeah, it is. Because if we look at certain papers, like this one published a few years back that looked at a particular bacterial strain, they were able to annotate around 17% of the hypothetical proteins using computational methods. So that 10% is very doable. So let me introduce you to the project that I give my students. So the project is really four main steps. And I'll go through each of the four steps and give you some examples. But one of the most critical steps, and I'll spend a lot of time on it today, is selection of the hypothetical protein that you or students want to evaluate. How you select the protein can determine what your outcome for the project is going to be. So I'll keep that in mind as we move forward. Once we have a hypothetical protein selected, we then can go through the computational analysis. Now I have it broken down into four steps, but know that this is completely flexible to whatever your needs are. If you want to add programs, great. If you want to change programs, great. If you want to remove programs, great. I modify this all the time based on one, what my hypothetical protein was, and two, the audience I'm trying to teach. If I'm teaching high school students, I don't wanna give them all four, I'll pick and choose. If I've got a graduate student, you can bet I'm adding to this list. So think about that. At the end of the day, you run your analysis with different programs, you've collected your results, and then you're gonna interpret those results to basically answer one question. Is there sufficient evidence to relabel that hypothetical protein? If there is, then you can contact the knowledge bases, you can contact the people that published the genome in the first place, et cetera, and we can make a difference. We can change the database. Or if it finds out that we don't have enough information, let's go to the wet bench. Let's do those knockout models, those structural analyses, and then we can go back repeat the process and improve our database. So this is our program in a nutshell. So let's talk about the details of hypothetical protein selection, because this is the first and, and I will argue the most important step. You need to consider it carefully because of the outcomes of the project and I'll point that out as we go. But here is a brief list of the different approaches that I personally have played with you can add to this list. So you can randomly select hypothetical proteins, students can do it themselves, or I can direct them in some way. We can use differential gene expression, either from a single gene analysis, like a T-score, singular enrichment analysis, like a Fisher's exact test, or a gene set enrichment analysis. We can also look at phylogeny. And if we know that a protein has a structure already, we can then do sequence homology to potentially find HPs, and there is a really strong evidence for relabeling annotation. So let's go into a little more detail. So student-directed random selection approach. So this is where the student is completely autonomous. You tell them there is NCBI or pub, or, um, Uniprot, excuse me, go find your protein. And they go through and they find one and they'll come back and they'll say, hey, Laura, I've picked whatever protein from whatever species. And you'll pretty much go, yeah, cool. So this gives students complete autonomy. They love it because they feel independent. 
and they don't need any prior knowledge to just go to the database, find something labeled hypothetical protein in an organism they like and run with it. It's great for classroom. And it'll also give you a class-wide representation of inaccurate and true hypothetical proteins. I bring this point up for a reason. In the classroom, I like discussion. Students like discussion. And so if some students randomly pick proteins that can be reannotated and others pick random proteins that cannot be reannotated, then they can compare the results and we can have more detailed discussions about why some are inaccurate and why some need more exper experimental evidence. There are some challenges with this though. You get a huge variation in the hypothetical protein selected. Some students will wanna take them from human, mouse, virus, archaea, bacteria, bacteria, whatever. And if you as the instructor are not well versed, you can get very uncomfortable very quickly when someone is giving you a virus and you are a eukaryotic biologist. So just something to keep in mind on your educational limitation. The other thing is that not all programs are designed for all organisms. So for example, I have P sort B is specific to prokaryotes. It does not run eukaryotic sequences and students may not realize that. So if you allow them complete autonomy, they're picking from all over. Now you have a little bit harder time reining them in if they run into problems. So just things to keep in mind. To address some of those challenges, I developed the instructor-directed approach. So what I affectionately call the class pet microbe. I have the class vote on a microorganism that they want to look at. They collectively will look at only hypothetical proteins from that one class pet microbe. And that allows some direction in terms of me feeling comfortable with the organism or proteins they've picked, but also being able to have them have some autonomy because they can pick a protein from the limited area. It limits the need for alternative programs. They still don't need any external knowledge, good for large classes, but you are starting to get less representation. And I'll give the example later of Yersinius pestis um, and the plasmid that my class looked at. So these are really easy beginner friendly ways to just pick a random protein. If you want something that's more meaningful, something you wanna take into the research, then you want a more sophisticated method for picking a hypothetical protein. So the easiest, more sophisticated, think statistical method is the single gene analysis. So here you are identifying genes of interest based on individual gene analysis between some sort of an experimental group and some sort of a control group. Maybe it's SARS infected versus mock infected. You then compare the gene expression either by T-score, fold change, or a combination of both. That's the volcano plot you kind of see on the right here. And then you select your hypothetical proteins from a subset of those genes of interest. So for example, we've got the volcano plot. We've got some statistical cutoff, you know, p-value less than 0 0.05 for my um, log change here. And then this is based on T-score, sorry. And then for fold change, I've got my cutoffs at five and negative five. So you can see now if I'm blue, these are underexpressed genes of interest. Reds are overexpressed genes of interest. And it's kind of hard to see, but some of them have yellow circles around them. Those are the hypothetical proteins. So those would be the ones that I would be most interested in. And this is great because then chances are, once I figure out these are related to a disease and I want to annotate them for that purpose, I can do experimental follow-up, you know, NMR knockout models that I've been talking about. So anything that's differential gene expression is good for experimental follow-up. 
genes, single gene analysis is good for single data sets, but you do need to know some statistics and you may not get inaccurate proteins. You're only going to get the ones that are true hypothetical proteins. Similarly, the singular enrichment analysis is another way to look at gene expression, except now we're looking at gene groups to try to identify HPs instead of individual genes. So this is very commonly used for a Fisher's exact test, for example. But the challenge here is that you still need some sort of a statistical cutoff to meet your group. So I like this method if it's an individual project, like an honors project, a capstone project, um, a graduate project, um, or if I have a small group of students, no more than five. These then can work together on the analysis. They can work together on the experimental follow-up. It's a win-win. Again, you do need some stats in order to really understand what's going on here. And in this case, you're going to need more than one data set. Now, this could either be data sets you're getting publicly from things like Gene Expression Omnibus or ones you're generating in your own lab. Never underestimate the fact you have a lab that can generate some of this too. But again, you're getting mostly true hypothetical proteins. You're not going to get the inaccurate ones. If you want a broader approach, you can use gene set enrichment analysis. So gene set enrichment analysis or GSEA is a little different from Fisher's exact test because GSEA considers gene signatures, all of the genes in a particular data set, not just those that meet a cutoff, like a p-value less than 0.05. So I like this method over the Fisher's exact test because it's more sophisticated, but students will need more statistical knowledge. But you're more likely to get um, genes that are important in the biological process you're trying to study. Okay? And again, experimental follow-up is the goal. So how would GSEA do that? Well, we do it by actually taking two data sets and comparing them to each other. So one signature will take the tail, the positive, um, or how do I put this? The overexpressed genes. And then we take the underexpressed genes and we make them individual gene sets. We then can compare each gene set to a second full gene signature with all the genes. And we can define what's called a leading edge, which is the genes that are really in common or statistically relevant between my signature and my query set. And if we do this in reverse and compare leading edges, we then get a real strong idea that a particular gene is associated with a particular condition. It's coming up in the positive red end for both of my signatures consistently. And that would be a better candidate for the lab than other ones, other genes that are not coming up consistently. So just something to keep in mind moving forward. I'm not expecting you to be experts in this. Uh, you know, If you need help with GSEA, by all means, let me know. But it's not for your freshmen, that's for sure. Another way to get hypothetical proteins is the phylogenetic relations way. So here you're going to take a known protein with a known tertiary sequence, and you're going to compare it to the public knowledge base and see if any hypothetical proteins pop up. So you can see an example on the right here. So here we have two proteins from Streptococcus, I have two unknown proteins, and then I have three proteins from Sophalambos. You can see through multiple sequence alignment that there are some areas of these proteins that seem to line up. And we can use that multiple sequence alignment to construct a phylogenetic tree. So the phylogeny relationship is a really good approach to identify inaccurately labeled proteins, not true proteins. 
So I like using this for students that don't have lab access, that can't follow up with experimental progress, but still want some sort of a computational project in honors credit, capstone, whatever. It does require additional steps and programs, as you can see on the right. But as I said before, you're going to get inaccurate annotation, not the true H piece. So briefly, I'm going to outline the programs used in the analysis. I'm just pointing you to a table that is in the paper that I wrote that I'll reference at the end, and you can look up for more details. All of the programs we use are properly cited. Um, you can see their descriptions here. They have tutorial videos that are put on by the people who make the programs. And I've also gone through and made my own tutorial programs. So if you go to the online faculty mentoring network to develop video tutorials for computational genomics YouTube channel, you will be able to point your students to about nine or ten videos that individually go through each of these and are great for class. So with what time I have left, I'd like to go through two examples of a hypothetical protein characterization project so you can see what the results are like. So our first one here is this AUH26. I'll just call it that. So we found AUH26 using phylogeny relationships. So I went to the protein data bank and I looked for proteins that were already crystal structured that were known for being multi-drug resistant transporters related to antimicrobial resistance. So then once I found one in particular, I went ahead and I did a side blast. And a side blast is a sequence homology measurement. So I'm taking my known sequence with known structure and I'm comparing it to all the other sequences in the public knowledge base. I found a bunch of proteins that were already labeled as antimicrobial resistant okay. transporters, but I also found a few that were labeled as hypothetical proteins. And one of them that we found was this AUH26. So then the AUH26 was selected out of about five that I found from this analysis. And I selected it because it was the closest in sequence similarity to the SAV1866 protein that I found in the protein data bank. It has 96% query coverage. So over the number of amino acids, 96% of them are aligning, and it's almost 40% identical. So it's pretty close already. AUH26 is around 600 amino acids long, and it is from a bacteria that is this cannabis um, organism, which is a whole different genus than Staphylococcus aureus, where our original protein came from. It is annotated as hypothetical protein in the NCBI knowledge base and was not included at all in Uniprot. When we ran AUH26 through our program, we started looking at sequence similarity. So we used BLAST-P for um, amino acid sequence alignment, and we found that there was already an ABC transporter permease from the same organism that was very similar to our sequence. Cyblast found a lipid A export permease, also very close, at least in query coverage and about 50% identity. When we looked at the domain, in this hypothetical protein, the conserved domain database search found one cog that was related to an ATPase permease that's associated with multi-drug transport system domains. Again, something we're very much expecting considering the fact we started with a search comparing a multi-drug uh, resistant transporter. PFAM, was able to detect two domains 
with very high E values that then were connecting or further supporting the conclusion that this is an ABC transporter. Moving on, we looked at 3D modeling. Let's get a picture of what this protein looks like. Let's see what its active site looks like. Is there any ligands that might bind there? And so to do that, I used FIRE2. FIRE2 made the model that you see in the lower right-hand corner from the sequence that I gave it. It did that with 100% confidence and it covered the protein 96% with around 31% identity. So you'll notice the picture is very complete. You get a good detail for these alpha helices, for example. There are some areas with quite a few variable loops, but you know, we're looking at 31% identity. Obviously, we need to confirm these things with experimental evidence. 3D ligand site, looked at the active site and any potential uh, ligands. So 3D ligand site found 14 amino acids and called it the binding site and said those 14 amino acids bind ATP, ADP, and magnesium, exactly what we would expect from an ABC transporter. And so then we looked at cellular location. SUI determined that this sequence was a membrane protein with five transmembrane helices. You can actually see those transmembrane helices in the predictive model by FIRE2. PSORT B says that it's a cytoplasmic membrane protein. Again, confirming what we were suspecting. So all of this taken together is very strong evidence that AUH26 should be reannotated as an ABC transporter permeates. And if I had a graduate student, I'd run them through some phylogeny, comparing it back to the original uh, SAV uh, 1866 that we saw earlier that you know allowed us to find AUH26, et cetera. So let's look at the second example. I'll just call it WP for short. So WP was found by one of my students as part of the instructor-directed class micro program. It is a 77 amino acid sequence from Yersinius pestis, particularly the plasmid PMT1. What had happened was the class had voted, they wanted Yersinius pestis and the plasmid was the most recently deposited. It had the most HPs. So I let my class kind of attack it. WP was labeled as an uncharacterized, sorry, uncharacterized protein in both NCBI protein and in Uniprot. When WP sequence was run through BLAST, no non-hypothetical proteins were identified. So the list was nothing but hypothetical proteins. When domain identification occurred, no programs were able to detect domains. When FIRE tried to model WP, it only had a 32% confidence. And you can see the picture that FIRE2 developed is very sparse and lacking and it needs detail compared to the AUH26 we saw a minute ago. It was able to cover about a third of the protein sequence with about half percent identity, you know, 50 percent identity. And even then, this model that was used for this picture came from a Homo sapien, which is going to be radically different than the Yersinius pestis bacteria that we were originally starting with. So again, a lot of room for more information. All this information already is telling me this is a true HP, but I let my students progress. 3D ligand site, unable to find a active site, unable to predict ligand binding partners. Looking at cellular location, SUI does show this as a soluble protein, but cannot identify any transmembrane domains. So it looks like it's hanging out either inside or outside the cell, but where? Not sure. 
And P sort B could not determine that. So overall, there's a very lack of evidence for WP. And so we concluded that WP is a true hypothetical protein. We cannot fix this annotation at this time. Now, WP may be a good candidate for the lab, for X-ray crystallography, NMR, et cetera. And once that data comes in, we can rerun and improve the database. So I promise to give you more information just in case this has been overwhelming. It's, it's been about a five-year project to put together and a load of fun. But anyway, I published my paper with the Frontiers in Microbiology in December of 2020. The paper is entitled Curriculum Applications in Microbiology, Bioinformatics in the Classroom. You will find the two examples that I showed today, but there are also two more examples, including one from SARS. There are also assignment instructions and grading rhetorics already there. There's an example course calendar, so you can see, for example, what topics would integrate into this project and when to, pre when to present them in sequence. And don't forget the YouTube channel. So, you know, you can direct your students to videos, walking them through each of the programs used in this project. So I'd like to take a moment before I answer any questions to thank my uh, coworkers and former now because I'm at Michigan State. But anyway, Zoe was a former student of mine who's now graduated and working in the laboratory. And uh, Susan Gunn is a colleague of mine with the College of Urban Education at Davenport. Uh, Davenport University was where I was working when I did most of this work, and they were gracious enough to give me the ME Davenport Legacy Endowment Grant uh, to fund publication for the paper. And so with that, again, if you have any questions after today, uh, my name is Laura Harris, and you can find me at training at msu.edu or on LinkedIn. And with that, I'll take any questions. Your participants, if you have any question, you can post it in the chat box. Thank you. I have the chat box open. Don't be shy. If you want more detail on something, I can go into that. We have plenty of time. <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate the compliment. Will this method work on finding the function of an unknown domain of a known virus? Hold on one second, my question scrolled away. On finding the function of an unknown domain of a known virus. Um, no, it will not. And the logic there is because the domain is unknown. So if you look in the domain knowledge base, there are cogs that are also labeled hypothetical. And usually what will happen is a hypothetical cog will then be part of a hypothetical protein. So you really need to have the cog identified in order to be able to know what your annotation is supposed to be. Um, so if you go to my paper, there's the SARS example. And in that case, you had a known virus, but you had a protein that had an unknown cog, an unknown domain. Now, because it was SARS, it very quickly went into the lab. They figured out what it was. It was annotated very quickly. Um, and I talk about that in the paper also. But no, unless there's lab bench work, you generally cannot do that. Okay. So let me know if you have a follow-up question. 
Could you please tell about hypothetical proteins once again? Yes. So basically, the hypothetical protein is a protein where you know the start codon, the stop codon, and you know that you have enough nucleotides in between to make a protein. Remember the codon table of life. So you need three nucleotides to give you one amino acid. So if your open reading frame does not have the proper number of nucleotides, it would not give you a functioning protein. So that's the idea of a hypothetical protein. We know that in theory, the sequence should work, but we don't know what work it actually does. Okay, so hopefully that answered your question. I'll just continue on, and if it didn't, you know, raise it again. Is there an internship in my lab? Uh, touch base with me on uh, LinkedIn or at my email. That would be great. Email's awesome. The uh, hypothetical protein can be categorized under UPE1. I am unfamiliar with UPE1. So hit me up in an email with more details on UPE1 and, and I'll be happy to look at it for you. Explain the role of FIRE2. So FIRE2, um, all these programs are free, by the way. You don't have to pay for any of them. I, I insist on that as part of my class. So anyway, FIRE2 basically takes the sequence that you have and it compares it to sequences of proteins with known structure. And then it will try to cobble together, or Frankenstein is what I call it, the different proteins that match up. So let's say I have one sequence, or if the sequence matches a polymerase, and the other half of the sequence maybe matches, uh, I don't know, some sort of a DNA binding protein. Then what FIRE2 would do is it would take the part of the structure from the one protein that it knows the structure for, and it copies it for that section of the protein that it's trying to model. And then it will do the same thing at the other end with the other protein, and you get a model that is like cobbled together between the two known structures to make a unique structure. Hopefully that makes more sense. Um, there are plenty of videos on YouTube that are put out by FIRE2, and there's papers are published also, so I, I recommend you check that out. Next question, love these questions. What are the advances in the treatment of Parkinson's disease on a genomic level? Um, I am the wrong person to ask about that. Parkinson's is not my area of detail. Please explain GSEA a little bit more. Um, I can, how am I doing on time? Yeah. Let me scroll down, I'll hold that question for just a, just a second. Okay, is there, I'll, yeah, I'll come back to that one question. Is there any specific tool we can use for genome annotation? Yes and no. So the programs I put together as part of this project are individual. But if you work for NCBI, they have a master that will do them all at once, kind of like what I showed on the slide at the very beginning. So unless you have a lot of money or you're an employee of a public knowledge base, no, there really isn't a really good tool for genome annotation. You get a genome from the lab, there will be programs you can use, and some of them are through the knowledge bases, through NCBI, for example, but obviously they're not fail-safes. Okay, I do remember that one question from a lot of compliments. Continuing on looking for questions. Okay, I'm not seeing any other ones. Oh, wait, one more. Future applications of HPs apart from genomic research. One thing I always put in my papers is that HPs are potential drug targets, particularly if you're using differential gene expression. So in differential gene expression, if you use something like a Fisher's exact test or the GSEA, yes, I'll come back to that, I promise. There you get groups of genes or you know, groups of HPs in particular. And then you have more than one 
candidate. And that's one of the big challenges with drug development is that you can have a candidate, but your can candidate may not be optimal or it may have a toxic benzene ring or, you know, you've always got to chemically tweak them. Whereas if you have more candidates, now I have different potential targets and there's more room for my project to be successful. You can also take this up a notch. So let's say I get a group of hypothetical proteins, I could do pathway enrichment analysis, maybe put them into gene ontology and see, is there a pathway that a few of these HPs are associated with? And you can start to tweeze out that way. Well, maybe I don't want to target the HP specifically, but enough of them seem to be associated with lysine, for example, that maybe I'll look at lysine. And then you don't necessarily target the gene specifically, you target the pathway activity. So there's a lot of room in there for, you know, what do you want to do with this? Hopefully that's answered your question. Someone wants me to put my LinkedIn ID. I'll have to do that in a minute. There's a Google Doc. Explain phylogenetic relations once again. So here's where you go to the protein data bank. You pull out your a protein of interest with a known structure. So this is one that we already have annotated. We know what it looks like. We've done the experiment. And then you will homology sequence or blast it against the public knowledge base. And there you're simply trying to find those inaccurately labeled proteins that are similar enough to the one you know about that you can say, yep, they're connected to each other Let's reannotate. Okay, so hopefully that's answered that. Metagene annotation. I'm not quite sure what you're asking there. How can we identify transcription factors in a genome? Annotate eukaryotes can explain. Yeah, I, I'm not really a euk person. I'm going to pass on that question. How am I doing on time? Okay, so with that said, Someone wanted me to go over gene set enrichment analysis. So I'll come back over here. Okay. So gene set enrichment analysis in a little bit more detail. So here you've got a gene signature. Okay. So you effectively have all of the genes that go up in expression between your experimental group and your control group. We'll say infected and non-infected. So these are genes that go up when I have an infection. They're going to be red at one end. And then at the other end, you're going to have genes that go down in gene expression in the group that is infected compared to those that are not. Remember that gene expression, how do I put it? GSEA is all based on differential expression. You need two groups. You can't just have one. If there's no change between the groups, in gene expression, my gene's going to be towards the middle. Okay, it's going to have a, a T score, a fold change around zero. So then, once I have from different experiments, I can compare across gene signatures. So to do that, I'll take the genes that are overexpressed in my infected versus uninfected, and those that are underexpressed in my um, treated or infected versus uninfected. And I'm going to create two different gene query sets. I'll call positive for the ones that go up, negative for the ones that go down. And then I compare each group or set of genes to an entire signature from a different signature, uh, different data set. And so you get these enrichment plots. So let me walk you through an enrichment plot. You'll see the signature on the bottom. Then above the signature, you'll see these black lines. The black lines indicate gene matches between your query set and your gene signature. And so you'll notice that the black lines tend to cluster at the red end of my gene signature. To quantify this, to put numbers for it, you have an enrichment score. So this is the green line that you have above. 
every time you have a hit, a match between the query set and the signature, every time you see a black line, the score goes up. And it will go up by whatever your ranking metric is, whatever your T score or full change value is. When I have a miss, then my enrichment score goes down. And so then the computer can calculate this enrichment score. It's a run sum total enrichment score. And the computer will find a maximum enrichment score. Any genes that contribute to reaching that maximum are leading edge genes. These are genes we are interested in because they appear in both the positive red end of my first signature, that's what made them join the query set, and now we're finding them as significant in the red part of my second one. Okay, And the same thing can be done on the blue side also for the negative query set but I can switch. So then I could say, well, I'll take data set two and define query set. And I'll use data set one as my gene signature. I could do the whole thing over again and then compare the leading edge I get from one direction versus the other direction and see if there are any similarities or differences. So that could be how you rank a hypothetical protein, for example. I hope that answered your question. I know you asked for details and that literally was five minutes of details. So I'll go back and check the chat real quick. Here, chat people. I got to thank you, thank you. Okay. And I think we are good. Um, someone wanted the LinkedIn. So let me stop my screen share and go look up my LinkedIn. One second. There we go. Okay, so let me go get my LinkedIn one second and I'll plop that in there for you. Here, Google Chrome. Uh, that's my, there we go. That's what you're looking for. Now, where'd you go? Here we go. Okay. So LinkedIn's in the chat. Sweet. All right. Well, again, training at msu.edu. And uh, thank you so much. I've enjoyed today. It's been fun. Monali, Monali, please mute yourself. Thank you, ma'am. So, last but not the least. On behalf of Bio Setup Life Sciences, I would like to propose the vote on thanks. A very good evening to one and all. My heartfelt thanks to our guest speaker, Dr. Laura Harris, ma'am, organizers, coordinators, faculty members, and my dear students for your participation and attending this webinar. Ma'am, I thank you for accepting our invitation for this webinar. The way you shared your knowledge regarding the topic was impressive and encouraging. On behalf of BioSetup, I thank each and every one for their contribution to make this webinar a successful one. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice day. Thanks. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, dear participants, uh, I have shared the feedback link. So 